So um, my name is David Heyman. I know some of you, but not all of you, the new students. I don't know. I'm on leave this semester. I normally teach one of the first theory classes, and I get to know a lot of the students. Um, I'm super excited to be off campus, but I'm also very excited to be on campus today to introduce Murray Leg, who is a, a fellow alumnus of uh, Cooper Union and a kind of a occasional lecturer here and a kind of regular reviewer but also a kind of full-time friend of the school, which we're really blessed by. It's one of our great, one of the great pleasures of having Murray here is we get to really abuse him substantially and never really <laughs> thank him in any kind of uh, I'll way. Get my I'll get my pay back. Yeah, pay back. <laughs> uh, so for those of you new to Austin, those of you who are in Austin, one of the startling things about Austin is actually how, and it's really scary, how little good architecture there is here. I mean, compared to comparable cities of this scale and theoretically this kind of stature elsewhere in the country, right? I mean, like historically, you can count the great, truly great buildings on one hand. We're in one of them, right? And this campus is certainly one of them. And then actually, what's really even more scary is that the last 30 years, which has been a, seen a run of construction, not since the Middle Kingdom, like in terms of profitability and overall kind of explosive construction. I mean, again, you can count the buildings, the kind of must-see buildings on a hand which is, it's terrifying. I mean, it's really, really weird. It's not for a lack of good architects. There are really good architects in this town. It's, I think, for a lack of good clients and actually for a lack of culture in the town of ambition that promotes ambitious architecture, which is strange, right? I mean, his, uh, Austin is historically cheap. It's one of the cheapest towns uh, that's ever been. <laughs> I mean, actually, we're sitting in a building which is a good example of that cheapness. The University of Texas, as you know, masterpiece by Cray, but it wasn't meant to be. It's just an accident that it is because the university gave, was given, the land grant university was given a worthless piece of land to run cattle, and from the cattle it was supposed to build a campus, but it was also given the mineral rights to that property unbeknownst to the state from which it built this spectacular campus by accident. There's no, re I mean, this campus is still a, an insult to the, to the legislature of the university. <laughs> And then the other thing is that it's a city which is really inhabited by people who don't want to be in a city. You know, I mean, they don't come to Austin. We don't have a museum, for crying out loud. When you, I mean, it's like, it's one of those startling, I mean, we do, right? I mean, it's, it's one of those really startling things about the city, that it, it doesn't want to be a city. And a, a lot of architects uh, 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 break their teeth against that. Um, what's really rare is to find architects who figure that out, who figure out the calculus of, on the one hand, these really tight budgets, and then the kind of mindset of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a people who, want, who very much want to live here with a slightly different kind of ambition. Right? You look through the history of architecture in Austin, there's a couple of great architects, like Atlee Ayers, right, who just get it. They get the relationship between, on the one hand, the kind of mindset of the place, and on the other hand, the kind of idea of the budget. So I'd say what's really thrilling is that um, Murray is in that handful of people. I mean, it's, it's really, really exciting. I mean, like Murray, I think, has really figured out this kind of strange mathematics of the relationship between those things. And his office is just starting to blossom with one project after another, where you just go, God, he's hitting it out of the park. He's hitting it out of the park. And it's really thrilling for us to see our longtime friend, Murray Legg, beginning to just explode in his office. So with that, would you please welcome Murray Leck. I got my own. Thanks, David. Um, thanks, David, for that introduction. Um, promise not to explode here uh, during the lecture. <laughs> that would be really unfortunate. Um, Most of the work um, that I'm going to show is from our architecture office, Murray Lake Architecture, which I started nine years ago. Um, there are a few projects uh, I also want to show from our public art collaborative, and um, like Lewis Leg, which um, LLL as we call it, uh, which is composed of my wife Deborah Lewis, who is a uh, filmmaker and professor of film here on campus at UT. She teaches at uh, RTF just down the road, and she's here in the front row. Really thrilled to have her for the lecture. And um, my sister, Andrea Legg, who is a visual artist in um, New York City. Project Roundup is what we call our 
uh, daily office meetings. Roundup, I'm glad you were, you were talking about farms here. Roundup refers to actually gathering animals. It's not the weed killer. Uh, <laughs> And um, it's, it's a, a time when we can get together as a group in the office um, to meet every day, basically. And it gives us an opportunity to work together um, on the designs and progress. Uh, I'm a strong believer in the team approach to design. And I think that um, the strength of the work comes from that. I promise not to read all of the, uh, the entire lecture, but I just wanted to get these first few thoughts down clearly. Um, it's a really subtle idea. Everybody says, oh, they collaborate in architecture, but I do think it's something that's taken us uh, really years to develop that uh, approach. And I'm incredibly fortunate to work with a smart, talented group of people, um, all of whom are here. I'm going to make you all stand up and wait. No, just kidding. No standing up. Um, <laughs> all of whom are here. Um, Travis Avery, uh, who I just have to say it's his birthday today, so happy birthday to Travis. <laughs> Uh, he was working for me before I started the office nine years ago and had a hand in, in every one of the projects. Um, Lincoln Davidson, uh, Harrison Marshall, and Catherine Odom. Um, just, you're all there. <laughs> Hi. And they're all graduates of the school. Also, over the summer, we were fortunate to have a great group of interns in the office, Catherine McCoy, Andrew Helmbrecht, and Stephen McCann, um, all also students currently in the school. And uh, I met all of these people through teaching and through reviews. Um, they were all trained by the remarkable faculty who had a formative influence on their thinking and approach to design. Uh, and I think this is really important because over the years we've had um, different people coming through the office, I'd say two thirds from the school. Uh, but it's taken a while to kind of see the effect of that, that the, the, the thinking and design being trained here and the influences had on the school um, is undeniable. And uh, the direction of our little office is really kind of shaped by the school for that reason. I also wanted to say on a personal note, um, having spent uh, several years hanging around the school, occasionally teaching, as David said, but um, mostly sitting on reviews uh, with my colleagues, I have learned a lot. Uh, my own thinking and approach uh, to design has been shaped by this relationship. And for this, I'm grateful. Um, and in uh, doing so many reviews, it's actually kind of interesting. I was thinking about it. I mean, finally, we get a chance to pin up. So go easy on us. <laughs> also, I just want to make a quick note about the photography. Um, most of the pictures uh, you're going to see, most of the, not all of them, but most of the photography is by a young photographer in town, um, Leonard Fermansky. And uh, I think uh, more and more photography has become more important to architecture. And uh, consider Leonard uh, really kind of a collaborator. All right. Where did this, let's see. Uh, the lecture's in three parts. Uh, I attended um, Maurizio Roca's lecture last time, which was um, packed. I'm glad to see so many people here. Um, I promise this lecture, this lecture is running about three hours, uh, maybe a little longer. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> It should be about an hour, maybe a, maybe a little longer than that, but it's basically broken down into three parts. Um, based the, 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 the projects are not um, being presented in chronological order. They're being presented um, in, in basically type and scale. Uh, the first part is called Small Houses, and they all share um, several things in common. Um, I'm glad you actually mentioned too, and it's, it's interesting in your introduction, like how kind of spot on you were. I mean, first the farm reference, <laughs> round up in the farm. And then, but also that, that, that there's so little good architecture in Austin, which is really something that has been kind of uh, something I've been thinking a lot about as well. Um, but small projects are um, meaning like they're between 800 and 1900 square feet. They're all relatively modest budgets. In fact, a couple of them are like the lowest, literally the lowest budget projects that we've ever worked on, both in terms of the fee and the time we've spent in designing them, but also in, in terms of construction dollars. And um, more importantly, they're all uh, cited within the city's single family zoning regime, which makes up a large portion of the land in the city as a single family um, zoned land, which is incredibly low density. It is about uh, five or six units per acre. So I've organized these uh, the seven houses in terms of increasing density, starting with a small house on a larger lot, 
and moving up to more houses, more units on much smaller lots. In, in a sense, looking at, trying to look at a kind of incremental increase in density. And uh, more and more, we're being asked to create denser projects on smaller lots with smaller, more flexible houses and units where we're pushing up against the constraints of the city code for that zoning. Um, and I think you've heard a lot about this. I mean, we call this the kind of missing middle problem. Um, but for the record, uh, the city wants to change these rules. It's really the neighborhoods that have kind of dug their heels in um, and resisted that change. Uh, the seven houses are located here on a map of Austin from 1955. And just to give you an idea of how much Austin's changed, you can see the furthest north project, the first one I'm gonna show you is in the Skyview neighborhood. This is off 2222 here, which was like the edges of the city then. And then further south down around Ben White is, uh, I guess this would've been a rural site. The city's you know, more or less kind of filled up this map now. Um, this was around the time of the birth of the low density suburban neighborhoods. And that's why I wanted to show it because we're designing in these neighborhoods that have a impact on what we do. And the birth of those neighborhoods has occurred like mid-century, you know, roughly 70 years ago. Um, the city has changed. Uh, well, the needs of the city have changed, but the urban constraints have not, have not changed. And this is uh, a kind of force that is really affecting how we design or how we think about architecture. Um, and I think what, what David was saying about that, I don't know if we've like unlocked the key to making good architecture. I mean, I appreciate the comment, but uh, it is um, that uh, we're trying to figure out what these forces are and kind of work with them rather than working against them, I guess is the, the idea. Um, and the one thing I wanted to point to, out to, I mean, I don't have a map of this city zoning, uh, but m most of the, much of the land or a, a large portion of the land of the city is kind of locked inside this single family zoning um, low density single family zoning regime or set of rules. The first project I wanna show you is in the Skyview neighborhood. This is 2222. Um, this is the classic uh, low density five to six units per acre neighborhood here built in probably the 60s, right? Something, 60s, 70s. And um, again, it is basically one unit per lot, although you're allowed to go to two units per lot. Um, an interesting thing about this map is that uh, this building, which is the um, West Koenig Flats Apartments, is a multi-story, super dense building. It's built under the city's commercial multifamily regime. Uh, and it is five stories. Um, and basically, to make these buildings work. I mean, I'm not gonna unpack the complexities of the code, but to make these buildings work, you have to go really, really big. You see them going around all over the cities, massive housing projects going up. And they're built under a very different re regime than the single family residential neighborhood here. I mean, if you drive down 20 to 20, you'll see it. I think it went up like five years ago or something. And this neighborhood contains about 200 houses. It actually goes off of the map here, continues around um, 200 houses and this building contains also 200 houses. So you can kind of see the difference between the two regimes, a single family regime with this incredibly inefficient use of land and then the super compact dense regime. And then what is not possible right now in Austin is to do something between the two, four units, six units, eight units on a smaller portion of land. It's not really possible. Hopefully it will be soon. And again, for the record, Many people want this change to occur. It's just that the, like, including the city, the city wants this to occur. It's the neighborhoods have kind of dug in and are resisting this change. So the first project I want to show you is in the, again, it's in the Skyview neighborhood. Um, this is a photo taken recently of houses in that neighborhood. I mean, just like two weeks ago, Leonard took many of these photos. And basically it's the architectural background or the context or the fabric that we're working within. Um, by most standards, these houses um, don't have a lot of architectural merit. <laughs> They're often, you know, on poor or shallow foundations. They have very low ceilings, like eight-foot ceilings, and often uninsulated. Um, they're kind of hard to appreciate. And I have to admit, as an architect first moving to Austin, when I was kind of surrounded by these buildings, the background, I mean, as an architect practicing in the city, you can't help but be, like, influenced by the, basically the building stock, the kind of fabric of the buildings. 
and um, I found them kind of hard to appreciate. However, over the years, I've actually come to really love these little, <laughs> little houses and really appreciate them. They have many positives. And I think David touched on it in his introduction. For uh, one thing, these were all very affordable. I mean, up until a few years, you could buy one. You could live in one of these houses and buy one. You could be an artist or a poet or an architect, a single person with a normal job, and you could afford to live in one of these houses. In fact, Lincoln uh, lives in this house right here. This is, <laughs> he does, yeah. with his wife. He's not a single person. He lives there with his wife. Um, he's been there for four years now, five years, something like that. Uh, this is the project that I actually want to show you here. Um, so, so basically, and I think David mentioned it, you know, what one of Austin's strengths, or if it wasn't its main strengths, was that it was an affordable city. Um, what we're facing now, and it's actually kind of hard to get our mind around, I mean, three or four years ago, these were difficult to afford. Now, in the last three years, we're trying to get our mind around that you know, they're like six, seven hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand dollars to buy one of these little houses. First project I want to show you is a little one of these, a remodel of one of these little little houses. Um, so a few few years ago, uh, an artist couple asked us to improve one of them. Here's our little house here, and again. Um, Approaching the project from the position of like not really liking the house that you're going to work on. I mean, a lot of people approach these houses like, let's just tear it down and rebuild it. We hear that all the time, quote, tear downs. Um, but they had a modest budget and they wanted us to basically improve it. So we added um, three little elements to it, actually three windows, one that points to the sky over the shower, one that is a window over the uh, kitchen sink, and a horizontal window which wraps around the living space and associated roof there. See, it's a modest little addition to that house. And um, you can see it from the street, um, the two little pieces that we added. Um, in, in plan, I mean, we really didn't add any square footage to this house. It's just simply kind of remodeling the existing house. So in the 50s and 60s, when they were built, I mean, there are three bedrooms and two bathrooms, and families were pretty happy with these as an affordable house. Um, our remodel was basically to, um, we did very little to it, in fact just kind of uh, renovating the interiors modestly. And section through that, this is the eight foot ceiling height, section through the new window, and this, this uh, new window over the kitchen sink, which is vertical, and the horizontal window, which wraps around the living space. And uh, reconstructing the roof to, and, and wall to create that new horizontal window. And the effect is a um, transformed space where the stick frame structure is exposed. So learning to just um, improve these little houses with a few somewhat modest moves. Um, in South Austin, similar um, house, single story house. Here we're improving the house, but by adding on to it and not really renovating the house itself. Again, a young couple who uh, had a growing family. And um, the interesting thing is it's on a corner lot here. I think this is actually a little later, maybe 70s construction, and it is even lower density. Here's the house and a two-story addition in the back. Completely kind of opposite approach. Instead of remodeling the interior, we're adding on to these modest little houses. In plan, again, they asked us to like, we didn't do a single thing to the existing house. Here's the existing house in yellow. Um, added a two-story box, which contains a little office. Um, the client has a little vet service, mobile vet service office, and upstairs a new bedroom. Very modest, 800 square feet. And a view of it looking out across the suburban neighborhood. An elevation, the existing house is low, reclining. Addition is super compact vertical. Uh, I wanted to just take a minute to try to go back. I'm not sure I have my thoughts together entirely on um, the, I mean, I love this little project. I'm, I'm not quite sure why yet. I'm trying to figure that out. But I went back to look at the original concept, the original idea for the house. Um, we do love working with light. So the original idea was we had a super compact footprint, two-story house to create a little two-story, or I'm sorry, a little, um, Claire Story 
box on the roof that would help filter and control light and bring it into the house. It was an idea to try to do something special on the inside of this very modest uh, little addition. And then um, thinking about pulling that Claire Story box from front to back and that it would have an impact on the elevation of the building that would create a figure. So there's a kind of figurative quality, almost like a kid drew it, a little figure. Uh, but it's coming from a very practical kind of rational idea about shaping light. And this is the result. I love that in that neighborhood, you know, it's all privacy fences, right? You're walking down, it's all privacy fences, and this is like it's looking out over the neighborhood. You can see the section through there, connection of the stair for cats, place for cats to hang out. And here's a section showing that, that box, which we shifted to align with the interior wall of the second floor. And then inside you can see the effect where, um, like Skyview, we're running the structure through, um, pulling the finished materials back and revealing kind of rougher structure on the inside. Oops. And then that figure in the backyard, and then at night looking out over the neighborhood. Uh, this is a 1900 square foot house on a pretty narrow lot. Our clients, uh, a young family, bought this property with friends. I think I need to explain this because one, one of the great challenges of building small is the economy of scale. A thousand square feet of construction costs a lot more per square foot than 5,000 square feet of construction. So you lose the economy of scale. It's one of the paradoxes of building small, compact units that are, you're, where you're trying to be affordable. So our clients, Nero and Carla, purchased a lot in West Campus. It's a walk from here. Um, with their good friends, uh, Ernesto Cragnolino and Krista Whitson. Um, they bought the lot together, they tore down the house, and they subdivided the lot so that they would each have their own lots. Uh, Ernesto is a partner with Kevin at Alter Studio, and Krista is one of Mel Lawrence's associates, both really exceptional architects. Uh, they, okay, again, they, they tore down the house, they subdivided the lot to narrow 40-foot lots, and then we designed our house with Nero and Carla, and Ernesto and Krista designed their house, uh, both about 2,000 square feet. We designed them in parallel, and then the idea being that we would use one contractor who's here today, Alex Bergman, Alex <laughs> is here, uh, and built both of the houses at the same time. So this project, I mean, I think we love building using physical models, but we really try to focus on that more than the digital realm. I mean, we're always using digital tools, but a lot of physical models, carving, big on the bottom, small on the top. We were like, this is the winner. Yay. <laughs> Let's do this one. And then it various iterations, I mean, we're constantly going through, again, the team approach to design, we're going through and revising over and over and over again, playing with it at night, the lights and the train model, and then the a final version, which is a kind of carved perforated block. And then what it looks like uh, in stucco. Again, it's bigger on the bottom, smaller on top. And our lovely neighboring house by Ernesto and Cristo, which is wooden and steel, bigger on top, smaller on the bottom. Um, on the lot, 40 feet wide, here's our little 2,000 square foot block. Again, very compact, very compressed house footprint. Um, this is important. A uh, little diagram. Uh, the orientation of this house is incredibly important. Um, we're pushing the house, as we're designing more and more compact houses, the space around them becomes more and more important. Uh, often in these single family residential neighborhoods, you have all of this like inefficiently used kind of like wasteland, the 10 foot space between houses, side yards as we call it, is kind of usually a dead zone. Here, uh, this house is oriented east west, and uh, we're pushing the house over basically to open up to the south and carving into it for light and access to the outside, creating little pop-ups to catch light in the rooms upstairs, and then we'll pop down, and then landscape elements to shape the outdoor spaces around our little compressed carved box. Here is a um, view of that south side. Uh, here's Lincoln, just to give you a sense of the scale. Lincoln up in um, deep carve on the south side on the second floor, which forms a terrace space. There, floor plan, ground floor plan is kind of an open plan around a core. Um, 
Again, we're, we're kind of packing a lot in here. There is a room in the front that Nero Van Carla asked us to create that would be, could be used as an office or workshop, access from the ground floor, but also for somebody, an elderly parent who could live there if needed. And then um, upstairs is uh, three bedrooms and a bathroom. And these are outdoor, carved outdoor spaces, kind of a dumbbell shape, uh, pop-ups to bring light into those rooms. And then this is a pretty important aspect of the house. Here is our second floor view on that south-facing terrace, which you access from a little door from the bathroom. That's the terrace here. Here's a section through the house. Um, we're bringing in the south light. You know, south is the best exposure, students. <laughs> it's important to understand. Sun is high in the summer, so it doesn't come into the house. Low in the winter, it enters the house low. We like that. We like to work with the orientation in the sunlight in the natural light. So here, the sun uh, in the winter is coming in low, south elevation. And then we've created a vertical slot in the middle of the house. Um, this is the second floor hallway. So that um, here's Travis saying hi to Carla. So that in this really compressed house, we have this one moment of, I don't know, soaring heights, <laughs> vertical, vertical space. But it's also a lighting device. You can see this is shot in the winter. Uh, with that low winter light coming in and kind of bouncing around on the sides of the house there. Uh, screen porch in the back, which is a little experiment with balloon framing, which we like, roof terrace of that. Um, I wanted to mention this too, that um, most of the projects we're working on, we're incorporating pho photovoltaic systems. They're becoming less and less expensive, easier and easier to install. Nirov installed, this is Nirov and Carlos' house, this is Ernesto and Krista's. Um, Nirov installed a modest system here, it's about 13 panels. I um, asked him to send me the electric bill, and um, you can see that um, this, these lighter bars here, the white bars are the power generated, the black bars are the power used, and, and so they're, with this really modest system, they're able to provide about two-thirds, half to two-thirds of the power for the entire house. I believe Ernesto and Krista's house is, in fact, 100% net zero. Um, I'll say at this point now, there's no reason why every new house that's built in the country uh, can't be, generate all its own power. And, and part of the reason is that, you know, we're building these houses very efficiently, so they're, uh, we're, they're using less power. Um, getting a little denser now, there's a, uh, this house in South Austin uh, we call Stacy, is a traditional auxiliary dwelling unit as uh, defined by the city of Austin. Um, you can do, in the single-family zoning regimes, two houses. There are severe restrictions, which have made it difficult to do it. Uh, but you can do two. This one is a little 1,100-square-foot um, house behind this one in the front, our client's house in the front. Uh, basically, front house and back house. And you can see uh, the triangular uh, shape comes from, <gasps> simply comes from the space that was left over between the setbacks for the floodplain that we had and setting back off of the existing house. These back to front houses present like a really weird challenge. I don't know if we've got it right, but you know, the front house has a front facade facing the street that presents to the public, and then you're, you're building another house in the backyard, and then that also has a front facade, but it's facing the back of the front house. It's just like an odd um, situation. Um, here is a plan of that house and an elevation um, it's a two-story house, two bedrooms upstairs, two bathrooms upstairs, and an open floor plan downstairs. This space is an outdoor space that is, um, has outdoor space on both floors. Um, to kind of think about or solve this problem of kind of the backyard, front yard um, uh, dilemma with these houses, we created a kind of thickened front to this guy here that you enter through. And again, I would say, just as a note, this may be not the lowest budget project, but pretty close. Um, the owner actually built it himself. But we're creating this thickened wall that you move through so that the house, uh, when you approach it in the backyard, it doesn't, isn't what it seems. It actually appears to be really thin, like five feet thick, and kind of hollow, almost like a stage set or a prop. Has a weird feeling when you enter it. It's like, is that, what is that? Is that just like a backdrop or something? It really has that kind of empty feeling to it. And uh, of course, as you move around to the side, it's quite thick and it opens up to the creek in the backside. Once you move through the stage set, you're in the house, which opens to this, this wilderness in the back. All right. 
Michael Holleran's house. Um, one of the great things about being an architect is you get to work with all kinds of really interesting, smart people. Uh, this is a project for Michael Holleran, who is an architectural historian and teaches here at the school. He's actually here with us. He's, here's Michael. Um, he came to us and asked us to add a small house to the backyard of his existing house, uh, which is here. The magenta is our little addition. Here's their existing house, which is a really lovely, beautifully preserved arts and crafts bungalow. I mean, kind of the quintessential house that you'd imagine an architectural historian living in. <laughs> beautifully restored arts and crafts bungalow, but he asked us to add on in the backyard. This is, a, of all of the houses that I'm, sh gonna sh I'm showing you, this one is uh, actually the closest in in the city. It's an older neighborhood. Um, it is Rosedale, and this particular lot is what we call a through lot. Here's the, the street here that the little arts and crafts bungalow fronts onto, and then it goes through to an alleyway in the back. This is Medical Parkway here, Medical Arts Parkway, Medical Arts. But anyway, these are all commercial buildings. So it's, it's a residential uh, lot that backs up to a commercial um, zone, commercially zoned and commercial building types in the back. Um, here is the front street, the little bungalow in the front. And when he came to us, he basically asked us to design a house in the backyard that he and his partner, who's an artist, could um, live in both houses as one have two houses and live in both houses as one. I mean, 800 square feet is pretty small. Live in both houses as one. We added about 700 square feet in the back, but with the opportunity that you could, um, in the future, live in one and rent out the other or sell the other so that you could use it as both, uh, um, you know, you have these two possibilities of inhabiting the house. And this is something that we're finding, we're being asked to do more and more of to have this kind of flexibility. Uh, when he came to us, he had uh, just a handful of parameters. One is it had to be made out of concrete block. Um, there was to be no sheetrock, which is a really fun challenge. And uh, that he, we would preserve the existing trees. Uh, construction photos by Leonard earlier in the summer. Um, the house has actually come quite a bit along from here. You can see the little bungalow with our new building in the back. And starting with CMU, uh, started to work on some experimental drawings that we do, just like internal process drawings. This is a rubbing of a concrete block. It's eight inches by 16 inches. And thinking about how um, the block is a self-contained unit and you add those units together to create a new hole. So you're starting with something that's whole and you're adding it together to create a new hole. And you can read those from the outside. You can read the individual blocks, mortar joints, and then something that would have uh, a new hole. And we use this to basically try to design the entire project that uh, so that it would fit within the matrix of space completed, created by the eight inch by 16 inch block unit. We call this an architecture coursing, where we're trying to course everything out so that you don't have to cut any blocks. You're keeping every unit whole. So everything is kind of fitting in within those unit modules. This is an elevation study, early elevation study for the alley side of the house. Um, one of the great things or kind of fun things about building really small buildings, you can draw them really big. This is a sheet, <laughs> a sheet, really big drawings. Uh, a sheet from our, especially as I get older, my eyes get worse. I want to see bigger, bigger drawings. Um, this is a sheet from our construction set, uh, one of Lincoln's drawings. And um, here we're able to draw the floor plan. It's 24 by 36 sheet at half inch scale. And that is important because we're able to actually draw every single L-shaped block and all the mortar joints and all of the elements so that we, they could fit within this space. We could see it in one drawing. Um, just a quick note on the plan organization. The plan is organized uh, in two blocks, a big block and a little block. The big block faces the alley, it's two stories. And the little block kind of completes a courtyard. There's a lovely fig tree here that we want to keep. It creates a courtyard between the existing house and the new house. And the little block, which is one story, has a little roof terrace on it, mediates between the big block and the little house in the front. And then inside, we're treating the wood elements, wood and steel elements that we're inserting in the same way, trying to keep them as whole units and working with, working with their modular units. Again, no sheet rock. So this is very much what it would kind of look like um, when it's finished on the inside.
uh, Maud Street. This is a corner lot in Austin, uh, in East Austin, that is. And um, this client, um, a really interesting client, he is kind of architectural hobbyist, I guess. He's hired some very good offices in Austin to design houses for him. In fact, um, Elizabeth Alford at Pollen had designed a project for him previously. And um, this is, I think, probably the lowest budget project in our portfolio. He's a very thrifty person. And um, this project is on an extremely small lot. It's about 6,000 square feet. And East Austin, you find the lots tend to run a little smaller. And Alejandro's a very clever guy, had us design two houses on this corner lot. See the little corner lot here? And then what a typical little house on that lot would look like. So our idea was to take the main dwelling unit, which Alejandro would live in, pick it up off the ground in a traditional kind of piano nobile where the main living space is on the second floor and you have kind of business below, main living space on the second floor. And then below that we'd slide in a garage, not even a garage for cars, like for bikes. I mean, this guy barely has a car. And uh, this is what I mean about things are changing in Austin. So clients are coming to us and asking us for these things like, I don't have a car, why do I have to have a parking space? But the code requires these things um, that we're kind of pushing up against. So we're sl sliding that. This also has like a little guest suite in it. Um, his parents are, come to visit, they can stay there or he can rent it out. Or guest suite underneath and in the back a, a um, auxiliary dwelling unit, about 800 square feet. And again, because the living space is on the second floor, we wanted to create some nice outdoor space. So we created this kind of large porch, porch on the second floor. The corner lots are actually nice for beginning to increase density because you have a driveway and approach for one house on one street, a driveway and approach for another house, and actually a little approach for the guest suite here. So we have like three, taking a tiny little lot, and we have three little living spaces, three units. This is what the houses look like. Again, orientation is super important here. They face south. Alejandro is a writer. This is his writing desk up here. And um, you can see that ah, it's a really weird house. It's like an apartment. It's really like an apartment. Have, the main house is an apartment. It's a walk up. You, you, there's a little entry downstairs with a closet and stuff. But you come upstairs and the entire house is on the second floor and has this large uh, south facing porch. And we designed it to make it look like it's floating off the ground. Again, like super low budget. Alejandro, he didn't build it himself, but he kind of sort of half contracts, half contracted himself. Um, initial study for that, because it's south facing, um, we wanted to create uh, a screen that would filter light, but it was also an opportunity to use light to begin to create a kind of screen or a mask that would um, create an identity um, for the house on the street. Here's Alejandro hanging out there. And these little tiny battens are like the battens. We use board and batten. We like to use that. So it's economical. Um, become the screen. And I thought this was like an interesting um, comment Mauricio Rocha made um, in the last lecture about the modernist killing light, which I thought was a funny comment. Um, not using light, but I think I understand what he means. Like, he, I think he meant like light as a decorative force, not just like a technical force. So here's that screen. And again, a nice place for cats to hang out in that porch. And here's the little ADU, which is like a small scaled down version of the big house. And, and basically the way the math worked, Alejandro built both of the projects, sold the ADU, and used the sale of the ADU to pay for the construction of the whole uh, site. Um, the final of the seven projects that I want to show you is four-ish houses, six-ish houses in East Austin on Canterbury. There's a couple of lots that go down to the water here. I mean, you're not really going down to the water. The, technically, the lot goes down to the water, but we have these massive setbacks off the lake that prevent any type of disturbance to the water's front water as edge. And here we're creating um, four houses. You can see the site plan. This is Canterbury. This is San Saba here. And um, you can already see these are super compact little homes. You can see how much more compact they are than the kind of sprawly neighbors. That's sort of what I like about looking at the site plans in this larger context, is that you can kind of see, compare your house to, the, to your neighbors. And um, we call these units A, B, C, and D. And um, for various reasons, I mean, the city code is 
kind of a train wreck. I'm sure you've heard that. But for various reasons I won't go into, we <coughs> couldn't provide vehicular access off of San Saba. We had to create our own little back alley. So each of the houses has kind of semi-private space where you park between the units here. So you're driving in, parking. It is nice in that it leaves a yard um, kind of free of cars. Um, I'm only going to show you the front house. All of the houses were designed with the same language. Um, this one is about 1,600 square feet, unit A, 1,100, 1,800, 1,700, something like that. But they're all designed with the same language. Here is our A in the front. Um, I really love this neighbor's house. Um, I guess one of the things we like to do is just like talk to the neighbors, kind of reflect what's around us. And um, I love these proto-modern houses. I mean, I think they're in the 40s or 50s. It's CMU, parapet wall, reads as a flat roof, kind of black and white. Uh, and it has these lovely little details made of concrete and stucco. So we're responding to that, although ours is a little bigger. Here it is from the front. It's very narrow and efficient, uh, about 16 feet wide, easy to span, very compact. Winter shot. This is Len. I mean, Leonard is like this. I mean, he went out, texted me on that the days when it snowed, and he was like, I'm going to go shoot your projects. I'm like, okay, let's shoot a white one. <laughs> that makes sense. Let's take a picture of a white one. It's kind of like looking at it. It's like funny because it's not Austin in a way, but it is Austin. Maybe Austin's future. Um, and looking back at our, our little neighbor here in our white stucco, um, their boxes, all of the houses are boxes with a two story hole cut in the middle. So what it looks like from the side. Um, one of the challenges with the site was that we're creating long, narrow buildings, which we like. We like long, narrow buildings. Uh, but the orientation for this project is like the worst. Um, we're doing um, the opposite of what you're supposed to do, which is we're creating a large west-facing facade. When the sun is low in the west, it's getting like pounded by the sun. So it's extremely energy inefficient. Um, but by cutting a hole in the middle, you create some new facades. You create a new uh, south-facing facade and a new north-facing facade. And when you have a west-facing facade, it is under deep shade. So we're able to do large expanses of glass um, inside the courtyard um, and not worry about the solar gain that uh, occurs with the sun uh, pounding down on that western elevation. Um, we call this a reverse coconut, white on the outside and material rich on the inside. Um, the other is a kind of climactic response. Uh, white is really the best color. It's highly reflective and cuts down on um, solar heat gain. So um, we have the darker materials on the interior. Um, the courtyard is a kind of anchor. You enter the house through it. You can hang out in it. And from inside the house, this is an important idea, from inside the house you can see from inside to outside to back inside again. And in these small houses, this is a magical effect of making it feel much bigger than it actually is. Um, on the ground floor, it really reads as two buildings. So here's a courtyard and you have a guest suite. Uh, again, Nils, our client, German, works for this amazing German prosthetics company that is working on amazing robotics prosthetics, robotic prosthetics. And his family comes and visits from Germany, but he can also have guests stay here in the main living space. And upstairs, we're packing a lot in with three bedrooms and an office workspace on the second floor section to that. And then again, uh, the courtyard is really a kind of lighting device where we're um, cutting deep into the building and letting light enter the interior and playing with that. Um, just a quick note, when we're working on these super compact houses, we have to be clever about nesting. Like everybody's always like, oh, it's such a small room. Where do I put my desk? So we have to think about those in a clever way. We do have a few um, moments when there's so much program, it's like st sticking out of the house, <laughs> pushing out. Like you make it compact and things poke out. And that um, those have program in them. They're like little work. They have two or three of these little workspaces that are set in the bay windows. There's Nils. All right, part two of the lecture is called Things for Kids. This is the fun part, <laughs> fun part of the lecture. Wanted to start with um, a couple of projects we did for a remarkable little school here in town called the Little Tiger Chinese Immersion School. And the school was started by an artist couple here in town, Mike Osborne and Maggie Chow. 
And uh, they're grads of the MFA program, the art school here, both like gifted artists. Um, they started the Chinese Immersion School in their backyards and it's, it's really taken off. Um, here's one of Mike's photos. I really encourage you to take, uh, check out his work. Um, I met Mike because I was just a fan of his work. I started to see his work around and uh, was really interested in it. Um, I would say Mike is like a really important collaborator on these projects because he actually acted as a contractor too. He built them. Little tiny, little tiger Chinese immersion school. So 51st Street, this is North Hyde Park. Um, they have taken over basically this church building and the neighbor, they're expanding. So they bought a neighboring residential property here. The Magenta are two, are two little projects that we did for them. We did like a little master plan to help kind of make it more cohesive. I wanted to mention this too because I think um, this is important. It was important for the house, the, the projects I showed you as well that um, what we're doing is um, as a kind of architectural approach and urban approach is really like flowing in or fitting in to the existing ad hoc urbanism and not trying to transform it but trying to respond to it and fit into it. Here are our two little, these tiger orange squares are our little so program. First project we did is a classroom building, a permanent classroom building. The second was a response to COVID, an outdoor classroom building. Here is a view from Eilers of our little classroom building in the back. And then again, this ad hoc urbanism that we're confronting in Austin, uh, the church building that Little Tiger Chinese Immersion School is in currently the house next door that Mike bought and moved into um, as a classroom building, renovated as a classroom building, and then we built a new little classroom in the backyard there for them. And again, from the alley, responding to the neighboring buildings, really loved these old, this is old shed building here, um, quite inspired by that, and wanting to respond to it and kind of talk to those. Here's our new classroom building. Here's the view of it from the front. It's really small, 700 square feet. Um, it's for little kids, like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, one classroom schoolhouse kind of model. And um, just a, a point here about something I think, uh, again, I'm not sure I can articulate it clearly, but something that we're quite interested in is taking familiar forms uh, in architecture, like a gable roof, and distorting them or modifying them to take them out of the ordinary and make them kind of surprising and unusual. And by beginning with something, there's a certain edge where you distort it enough and it's unrecognizable. And I think something that's really it becomes more and more important to us, I mean, particularly in the public art, is that the architecture can be easily understood by people, that they can see it and understand it. I feel like a lot of what we do is really like inaccessible to people. They see it and they have no way to kind of understand it or relate to it. Um, here we're distorting the roof, we're making a kind of a big sheltering roof and bringing the eave down really low to make it kind of kid height. Here's the entrance, here's the little, little kids coming in. Um, on the north side is a long low bay window and that serves as a little place to sit uh, for the kids bench height, place to sit to change your shoes and hang up your coat and stuff from the cubbies. And then inside is a vaulted uh, space daylit from above. Um, this is important. Um, we're huge fans of the architect Max Levy in Dallas. Um, he's really good too at like doing remarkable things and very, with very modest means. Um, this is a um, detail that we borrowed from Max. Um, thanked him many times in articles too about the house. I'm like, Max Levy inspired this. Don't kill me for taking your idea. Uh, but it's a scissor truss. We love scissor trusses. They're extremely uh, economical. They're prefabricated uh, trusses. I think the trusses here were something like $1,500. I don't know, Mike would know uh, much, but they're very, very affordable. And basically we're, um, uh, where the truss is the deepest uh, structurally, which is at the, the ridge, um, we're opening it and creating a skylight and, and then letting the truss come through the skylight opening and, and cladding on both sides to create a kind of baffle so that, you know, the Texas sun is so powerful. It's taken me a long time to kind of figure out how to like control it. A little bit of it goes a long way. You don't need much. Um, but basically keeping the direct sunlight out so that it bounces around inside this and creates diffuse light in the classroom. Um, occasionally, for a few weeks out of the year, it comes directly in, which is kind of fun, but it's during the summer. And then what that looks like, that diffuse light. This, in fact, is like a color photograph. It has this very kind of glowy, diffuse light quality. It's always hard to kind of photograph the quality of light in buildings and photographs, but Leonard has been doing a pretty good job. 
and then kind of looking up, you can see how there's that light, direct sunlight reflecting off of the baffle. And then the classroom, again, with that little, um, once in a while, some light enters the uh, building, classroom. Um, we completed the classroom, they opened in the fall, then that um, year, as you know, COVID hit, and Mike called us, I think it was like June, after COVID hit, and he was like, we're gonna move all our classrooms outside. And he asked us to, could you design a temporary shade structure for us? And um, he had a few requirements. He said it had to be built really fast, had to be super cheap, and um, it would leave, that it would leave no trace. So we created this uh, shade structure uh, working with two by fours. Um, it's all engineered by Fort Structures, uh, an engineer we use in town, um, of dimensional lumber, easy to buy, relatively inexpensive. At that time, it was inexpensive. Lumber kind of, of course, spiked in cost. And then it's connected to the ground with these lovely earth anchors so that when you pull it up, it would leave no trace. A little built-in bench for the kiddos, kind of metric. And then, um, actually we designed a clever, um, big architects course, we wanted to design everything. Uh, a clever shade structure for the roof, but it proved to be really expensive. So we found these that we could basically buy online, ready-made. And um, the classes were moved to the morning because it was cooler for the kids. They didn't want them out in the heat of day. So uh, a lot of the shading occurs um, on the vertical surface. So this vertical walls are also shading devices here. When the sun is low, the roof provides about half of the shade. Um, one of the things that was kind of like, I mean, we built this, designed it in about a week. And again, this is what I mean about economy. It's also economy of our time. It doesn't, you know, they don't have a lot of money, so they can only spend so much on like on architectural fees. That's one of the challenges of design is uh, how much does it cost to design something. Um, and, uh, but one of the interesting things about this is that it was built in the playground, which is kind of a weird mix of like classes in the playground. It's kind of a fun idea. And it was completely unexpected, but the kids really took to it and started to kind of climb on it and play on it. You can kind of see they're literally climbing the walls here, which they were encouraged to do so. So it was kind of like interesting to see the kids using something that was like a COVID response, which is quite a negative thing for something kind of positive. Um, we were only able to do this really quickly and inexpensively um, through having done a lot of like experimentation through our temporary public art projects with temporary installations. Um, one of the projects is a legless leg project uh, that was commissioned by local art museum here to create a mini golf course uh, at the Lag Laguna Gloria site. Um, they commissioned artists and architects to basically create holes for a mini golf course. Uh, I actually did this when I was teaching advanced design and several of my students helped design and build. I think Harrison worked on this. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, it's basically designed as a fort. You can see using two by fours and um, in this tripod shape. This is where the sort of like stability idea, structural idea came from, working with two by fours. This is actually just literally kind of pegged to the ground. And um, it is, uh, this fort encloses a loop. You tee off here. You putt around. There's not, I don't know, Peter Pan golf still exists in Austin, right? So it's a funny, yeah, it's a design a golf course, but not really a golfer. But uh, anyway, you tee off here and um, you putt around and the, the, the hole is right here. That's why we call it loop, so that you, if you miss the hole, you've got to go around again. If you're really bad, you're playing infinitely. Um, here's our daughter, Eva, on the putting green. There's a little sand trap, rock garden sand trap in the middle. And then here's a hole, so again, with a little step down, so it's like an incomplete loop. Um, another experiment with stick framing. This is a um, outdoor non-denominational chapel in a cedar forest. This project goes back uh, quite a ways, but I wanted to show it because I think it's important. Um, again, experimenting with wood, experimenting with stick framing. Um, it is sited on a lake in a uh, cedar forest. And, and basically it is uh, a frame, which are moment connected. These frames are made of cedar, which increase in their rustication from very rough on the bottom to refined on top, two by fours. And this frame is basically like uh, the outline of like a little kid's drawing of a chapel. You can see it there. 
and then the frames collapse inward and create a new figure on the inside, and they're repeated frames. Um, it has a kind of novel structure where they're, all of the frames, you can see these, you call these rough uh, sawn two sides, so Wamplers is a sawmill nearby. We basically looked at the material they had, super cheap. We designed it around the availability of the material. The more refined material, like the two by fours, were way more expensive. So we kind of use that rustication to keep costs down. Um, but these frames are all um, held together in tension horizontally by a cable right here. And they're, they're held together uh, in tension. And then, so the upper members are actually cantilevered and free to move. So when the wind blows through the surrounding forest, the structure moves and a connection to the forest is made. I mean, normally, like uh, when the building moves, it's like a problem, but here it was actually a good thing. You don't want your buildings to move as an architect, generally speaking. And then Leonard uh, going back to look at um, what it looks like now. Those photos were taken when it was first built, but it's a sort of aging creature in the forest. And, and again, I think the important aspect of the project is this idea of, of having two figures, an outer figure and an inner figure that are nested together. They're, they're, figures are kind of the opposites, but they exist together in one thing. Another of our public art projects, uh, this one for Huntington, Long Island, had a summer program, hire artists, design installation in parks uh, for a month or two. This one is called, un it was called Unmanageable Hill. We keep changing the name of it, but basically it's kind of like garden ornament or topiary, I guess it's a cone, it's about six feet high. And we thought it was just kind of a fun um, challenge to use just sh sod and shipping strapping to kind of create this uh, topiary. Um, always thought sod was kind of interesting material. It's like living, but it's also like a building material. And then of course, over the uh, course of the season, unexpected thing happens, it kind of slumped and grew out and turned into this strange creature. Um, and based on this wild success of that, it's actually not wildly successful. The maintenance crew, uh, when we completed it, came and took it away because they thought it was a <laughs> pile of like abandoned material we didn't use. <laughs> And then the curator of the program was like, I'm so sorry, they took your project away, so they hired us to build it again a second time. <laughs> but in any case, we were commissioned to do nine of them. It's so strange in architecture, like you do things you don't know, you think you'll never do one again, and then somebody's like, I love it, give me nine. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but this is for a very special client, Alexander Reeford, who is an incredible curator of landscape, of architecture, of, of um, temporary installations. Um, he curates the Jardin de Matisse in Quebec, where he hires artists, architects, and landscape architects from around the world every year to do projects on that site. They're semi-permanent. Sometimes they're around for a year or two. Sometimes he's done like amazing little buildings up there that are, that are permanent. So here we built nine of them, all little uh, garden gnomes. It's funny, nobody asked us when we were doing this, like, what is this? It's just like, oh, look. Yeah, yeah. It's like kind of take it for granted what it is, I guess. Kind of like garden gnomes or topiaries, I guess, would be sort of a garden. But the idea was we were trying to make them identical, which is like an impossible thing to do, like machined identical. That's why they're on a grid, all the same. And of course, over the seasons, they slump and grow out and turn into these creatures. And I absolutely love that the straps look like tusks, you know, <laughs> like creatures moving through the forest. Um, very mysterious too, kind of scary when you see it and you're walking around. The Jardin de Matisse is this amazing place. You get a chance to visit it um, in Quebec, incredible place in the summertime. And then of course they would send us pictures throughout the season of these uh, creatures, what they looked like. And the next year Alexander was like, we love it, but it's overgrown and it's falling apart. Can you do something with it? So um, it had become really wild, really overgrown. They had had a very wet year. It was almost like a swamp in there. So we actually kind of loved it in its wild, decrepit, overgrown state. Ruined state, decaying state. So we proposed to create uh, what we call nature walk. And uh, it is basically a balance beam which would weave through the garden and be a kind of nature walk, but a challenge too. You really had to pay attention to moving through the space or you'd fall into it, <laughs> into the swamp. And here it is. Uh, they, they have an amazing crew of builders and fabricators there that, that did a really great job. I think one of the things, too, that um, with our public artwork, we, we don't have very many rules, but we like to work on things we consider to have, like we call it multi-leveled. And But um, 
And one of the rules is that it has to be engaging to kids. And if it's not, it's like we're failing to do that. I kind of love this project. I love this photo for that reason. Kids love to walk on things, the balance beams and stuff. Um, the last project we did for Alexander, Fractal Garden, and we wanted to do something completely different, something that was like not connected to the ground, that was uh, mobile. Uh, we created a uh, mobile garden, which is a set of three planters. And um, we built seven of each of these, so 21 in total, to turn a garden into, uh, create a garden from kind of tiling game. I don't know if you have kids like tiling games where you take shapes and you put them together to create different puzzles. I mean, this was literally like our daughter Eva had this tiling game. You know, sometimes you're so tired as a parent. I was talking to Corey about it. It's like, what are we going to do for this? It's like you see this thing on the floor. It's like, oh, let's do that. <laughs> but uh, here is our daughter with the little book we created. Infinite number of ways you could organize the garden. And we like this idea of giving people agency to trying to find ways that people can interact with it. Oh, let, I want to make something else with a garden. Here's Andrea wheeling some of the planters around. And then the result are these funny shapes, gardens. Um, that you can create in different patterns and different shapes. All right, that is the last, back to reality, <laughs> back to the serious project. Um, I wanna show, the last two projects I wanna show are two courtyard houses. Um, this one we don't really get to show very often. Um, the clients um, have asked us to not publish it, so we don't really get a chance to publish it. It is in, um, located in uh, Travis Heights. This is Lively Elementary School. And basically our client uh, bought, she's a really visionary client. Um, the Kalkashu Lumber Company existed in Austin in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. And it was this big lumber company that provided building materials for um, the construction industry. They also had this like early prefab kind of kit home. You see these around town, you can kind of spot them, they'll call them Kalkashu cottages. And, and basically they provided all the material. You could buy one, they provide all the material. And I'm not sure if they built them too, but I actually think they might've built them for you. Um, our client bought four of them. They were located on a property in South Austin. They were kind of in not great shape. The interiors were really quite um, deteriorated. And the previous owner had, uh, as he called it, a permit to crunch them. So basically he was trying to sell the land for development. Our client came in and bought it to save them. And this is what it was, looked like when we first bought it. She asked us to um, create a new um, house for she and her family um, that would be like a live workspace. They're both artists. Um, so they could work at home, live at home, but also a house for her, um, at the time, 99-year-old grandmother and um, elderly aunt to live on the property. So here are some early sketches that we created to um, look at what we could do with the cottages. For various reasons, we chose not to move them around, um, basically for cost reasons. Um, it's a motor court, so um, the little houses would have been rented by individuals. We would have parked in the middle. And um, our idea was to kind of open it up in the middle and to think about the geometry that those little houses was creating. Um, create new access points instead of down the middle to create new access points. Here's, uh, the grandmother, Nana's access here, and uh, access from the back. It butts up to Clifton Street in the back, so um, the new house, which we're thinking about locating in the back, could have access. And then um, what that site plan looks like. Uh, these are the historic motor court cottages, um, a new house which is U-shaped in the back, with access from Clifton, and uh, the middle space is a landscape courtyard, and we're closing the end with an elevated um, little orchard space and access from the side. The model by Travis. And then so from the street, it would just look like, the idea was you wouldn't see the new house or the new intervention really. There'd be a few landscape elements but it would pretty much read the way it did when it was built historically, like little houses uh, minus the cars. And we love these little houses, little cuties. We studied them very carefully. They have this like fantastic pyramidal roof roof and uh, we basically restored them. I mean, we're not preservation architects, but we like to do it when we have the opportunity. So we really studied these, uh, we preserved them, studied them closely, they had this fantastic, amazing, very delicate, almost bird bone like roof structure of two by fours and strapping with metal siding on it. And to think they were, it was up for like almost a hundred years um, through storms and hurricanes and the structure survived. 
This was attic space, so inside were really awful. The ceilings are very low, most of them kind of falling apart. Um, but we restored the exterior. This is one of the offices. And basically what we did inside was like completely new. We vaulted the spaces, opened them up. This is um, one of the offices, one of the office spaces. Uh, one of the clients is a filmmaker and inserted a new program into it. Here's the floor plan. So that space you were looking at is here. It's one of the cottages. So we opened it up inside and inserted new little program elements, which has like a little bathroom, a little kitchen, a little workspace. Um, and each of the cottages is completely different inside, repurposed differently. Two of them are standalone, and two of them are connected with air-conditioned links with these little tiny little jetways that we created that links to the new house in the back, the new house's access from the back. And it is two houses, house for the elderly aunt, and um, when they moved in, 100-year-old grandmother lived in this house, and then the client lived in this house. So all told, they're... Um, uh, smaller houses, actually four units. That's what that uh, new house looks like in the back. And then um, a section through the property showing um, the new house, which is basically a gable with a flat roof, front porch, back porch. This building has photovoltaic system, which provides most of the power for the entire project. Also extensive rainwater collection comes off this roof. The tanks are housed underneath the cottages. Uh, again, like Little Tiger, we're kind of interested in taking familiar forms. This is a very traditional form you find in Texas, a gable roof with dormers, porches on either side. This time, the orientation was good, south porch, north porch. But again, we're distorting it slightly, and we're creating these strange, squished, elongated dormer objects in the roof. Foundation pulling out to create planters. You move up through that foundation to get into the house. This is the view from the back from the Clifton Street side. And then the light objects. I mean, I think as you gather, we're like really interested in how to control and shape light. This is actually one of the more successful um, attempts at that. These dormers are tall, have tall windows that face north and south, catching a slice of the sun, and then the great north light on the south side. And it's really important that we're pulling them up above the ridge line of the house. And um, you can see a model here. Um, here's one of those dormers, and it is located underneath the staircase that winds up to um, one of the other client's workspaces. Uh, she's a collector of old type, and she has her studio space up above that. Um, so this light well is connected with a staircase. You move up the stairs underneath the light well. And you can see the interior, how that, um, that light well, um, it's like the opposite of Little Tiger, where we're bringing light down through the ridge line that's hard because you're cutting across the structure where you don't want to do it. Um, but here, it's turned the other way where you're um, uh, creating these figures in light across the gable and bringing light in to the vaulted space below. All right, the last project, how are we doing on time? One hour, okay, perfect. Um, this is a project that is in, under construction right now. It is in process. This is actually a Google Earth photo of it. If you go to the site, you can see this construction site um, underway. And it is located about an hour north of here. It is, um, here it is, da-da, no, just kidding. Um, it is a, um, a house, it's two houses actually. And one of the challenges of building out of town is that you're never sure who's going to build it. I mean, this is about an hour, an hour and a half, maybe two hours depending on traffic up by 35. Um, it's hard to hire the local tradespeople that you rely on in Austin to do projects. Um, you ask them to commute back and forth, which is not realistic. Um, or some of my colleagues are actually putting people up in these um, locations, but that's also not really realistic. So when we started with this project, we met with the owner, and um, we decided to just kind of look around at the construction resources and what was going on in the area, So then thinking we could kind of connect with that. He did find a builder who was interested building the house, but he was used to building very um, typical sort of suburban houses that you see in the area. And um, this one, um, this is ba basically a kind of precedent study for the house. This house is actually literally like right here, <laughs> this one. Um, I grabbed this off of Google Earth too. I was like, the precedent studies. So um, something we love about architecture too is like every time we have a new project, we like to look at precedents. And I think like we do in school, typically we're looking far afield. We're looking at examples of like exemplary architecture for those precedents, Finland, Portugal, Tokyo. Um, 
And I think more and more it's like interesting to look at like just kind of the more mundane, plain construction projects that are in the area. And here we're doing it just for practical reasons. Um, wanted to create something that uses systems and methods that would be familiar to the crews in the area to make it easier for them. Um, this is a typical suburban ranch, hip on a gable, and it has some like interesting properties. It has a kind of lovely, flat, precise eave line. It has a large kind of figurative roof. Those would all be prefabricated trusses. And it has all the program nested under that roof that is um, really busy program that's going on. Here's our house, it's a square that is uh, basically two houses. Uh, the main house is in two blocks, the main living space and a um, bedroom wing and then a guest house and a utility building. Um, one of the interesting things about this project is, is the first time, we're doing a lot of projects that involve like a certain degree of rainwater collection, certain degree of solar. This project will provide all of its own water. It does not have a well and it does not uh, it is connected to the grid, but it will provide 100% of its power. Um, and it's not connected to city water. So the, the program elements, elements form a um, square here uh, around some lovely trees. You can see a figure ground drawing of that. So inside is kind of a perfect square in the buildings. And then outside is kind of raggedy with elements poking out where we would have, need to have program inside a bit cleaner, outside a little raggedy. And these are outdoor spaces, screen porch, terrace, outdoor little courtyards. Um, these two blocks are connected by a little link that you can walk through. Um, then superimposing the roof on top of that, of course, if you wanna provide all of your own power and collect all of your own rainwater, you need to have a lot of roof, which is good because those houses that uh, you see built all around, I mean, one of the things that's remarkable about them is they have these massive roofs. I mean, if you fly into, Austin or flying to Dallas or flying to Houston, look over the suburbs, you're just seeing sea of roofs. Um, that's the main kind of quality of these houses. So, so this is showing the, the dash line is showing the, the houses below, blocks of the houses below. And then the inside line of this white area is the edge of the inside eave. The outside is the edge of the outer eave. And that inside is like a perfect square, outside is a imperfect distorted square. See that figure, the inside square and outside square slightly distorted. Very subtle in plan, but when you look at it, when you approach the building, it actually makes the building read as kind of a round building. It's much more dramatic effect and, and elevation. And we're doing this for a couple of reasons. Um, here's our um, hip on a gable roof. It's basically like gable turns into a hip, turns into a gable, turns into a hip, turns into a gable. Round in a circle, continuous circle. and. When we met with the rainwater collection consultant, he was like, uh, level gutters, we always like to have our gutters really level, we hate to always have to slope them, but here we're able to um, slope the gutters to points of rainwater collection, which is helpful. And then a model by Stefan Britz. This was, Stefan was working in the office <laughs> at the time. He built a couple of models, just a really big one, but then this, this little guy. So you can kind of see there's a square um, taking that. You can recognize the ranch house gable and it is just um, rotating around uh, and around. It is set in a pretty, um, we're setting it in the ground, cutting into the ground a little bit here, and it's a little bit out of the ground here, creating this kind of flat datum. And then what it looks like uh, under construction, here's linking like the construction site with that eave coming down. There is some stone, uh, it will be in the inner courtyard is lined in stone. So we're again taking the suburban idea. You know how in suburban houses you find like stone on the front as decoration. So here we're taking it and putting it on the inside, cement board on the outside. And then the spaces will be vaulted inside. These are just from a couple of weeks ago. Um, drone shot of that kind of, see the house, uh, gable roof house there. And uh, you can see this massive rainwater collection tank in the back to collect all of its own rainwater. And again, I wouldn't say this is like a low budget project, but this has gone a long way to help keep it within moderate range, I guess. It's definitely not like a luxury house by any means. And then what it looks like from the front, uh, messy construction site. You can see that sloping eave and some of the little cat ear pop-ups to catch light. Um, and then that's it. Thank you.